Hey everyone, this is Blackbinder, and today we're going over 10 beginner and intermediate tips that you may or may not know in Tales of Majayal. Please remember to like or comment below and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. For tip number one, you're almost always going to want to wear heavy or massive armor. This applies to mages you would normally think only wear robes, like the Archmage, Necromancer, or Alchemist. The armor you'll come across in Majayal are cloth, which consists of robes, light, which is mostly leather armors, and heavy or massive, which are the big plate mail you see knights wearing. For the purposes of which skill you need to raise, cloth armor is considered light. Now, there are a few exceptions to this rule. If the class you're using has the mobility skill tree, such as the rogue, or has skills that specifically require light armor to use, like the Cultists of Entropy's Void Stars, you still, you'll still want to go with light armor. Now, with Cultists of Entropy, I don't think... I think heavy armor still wins out even with Void Stars, um, but I'm not going to get into the reasons why there. Mostly it's, mostly it's just because... Heavy armor is better defensive-wise, and you'll run out of Void Stars very quickly, and some of your spells are even powered by them, which makes them run out even quicker. Now, some of the benefits of heavy armor are higher hardiness, which lets you more effectively use your armor, a small amount of crit reduction, which lowers the chance an enemy attack will actually crit you. That's that's the big problem. That's how you get one shot out of nowhere, is something's going to crit you, and you're not, you, you're not ready for the damage. Uh... <clears throat> Regardless of whether or not you go heavy armor, though, you still want at least one point in heavy armor, as this is going to allow you to use heavy gauntlets, helmets, and boots. Right here is heavy armor training. Note that the only equipment slot that matters when it comes to skills is the chest armor. You can have all heavy gear on and still take advantage of light armor skills, so long as your chest piece is not heavy armor. Right here. Uh, if you are a class that starts off without generic armor training, you can go to Last Hope, which is where we are right now, and learn the generic skill tree at any weapons merchant. So I usually just come to the sling merchant here, and you can go to I am looking for martial training. And I've already trained it with this guy. It costs 50 gold, um, but you can train in the generic use of armor. Well, it's really the combat training tree altogether. Um, you're going to want this even if you don't go heavy armor, because you'll want thick skin or light armor regardless. So... If you start off without training, like a Necromancer or Archmage will not have training, you still want to go train this in Last Hope. It'll cost you 50 gold, and it's a very, very good investment when you get to late game, especially thick skin, in my opinion. Tip number two, you want to get hit point items early. There are some race and class combinations that have a very low amount of hit points at the start of the game, and because of this, your biggest defensive boost is going to come from hit point items. With skills that don't scale off of weapon damage, like uh, a Necromancer's Invoke Darkness, they gain damage very quickly, but they also start capping out at around mid-game when you start maxing out your stats, your magic stat, and stuff like that, and it works pretty much the same for enemies. What that means is, uh, like, if you start a solip solipsist early in the game, your Mind Seer is going to destroy all enemies really easily. But by mid and end game, Mind Seer is actually a pretty low damage ability. That means early on, da the damage enemies do compared to the hit points you have is not nearly as balanced as it's going to be end game. Uh, the best two places you're going to want to look for hit point items in the early game are the Leather Plate and Cloth Shop in Last Hope and then in Dearth, the Lantern Shop. As you can see, we're still in Last Hope here. This is the Leather Shop, the Plate Shop, and the Cloth Shop. You want to check them all, because even if you don't have heavy armor training, you will want it eventually. So uh, if, you find, uh, if you find an armor piece here that gives you hit points, like this one right here is perfect. It's got 9 armor, 3 strength, 3 con, 52 life and it only takes 28 strength this is perfect this is what i would want to buy and it only costs 107 too it's actually pretty expensive i, I normally like to keep it around 60 gold but um i would still buy this because it's the only one here that actually gives me hit points in last hope merchants here can sell cloaks chest armor and belts that all have a chance to roll plus hp on them now for the next part we want to go to the halfling city of dearth what you want to look for here is this little shop right here. It looks like a tool, like a mine and shovel, but it is the tool shop. Here, what we are looking for is anything of health, like Survivor's Brass Lantern of health. It gives you 42 hit points, only two light radius, which sucks, but there is a specific item you can find here that basically means you're going to have a good run. What that's, what that's called is the Bright Brass Lantern of health. 
Now, what that normally does is it's going to be the Survivor's Brass Lantern of Health minus the Heal mod on it, minus the Physical Save, but it's also going to have a Light Radius of 5. Now, a Light Radius of 5 and 42 health early on in the game is awesome. It sucks not being able to see your enemies. So, first things first, you definitely want to go to Last Hope, see if there's any HP items there, and then come to Dearth and see if you can find your Bright Brass Lantern of Health. You might, you might not but look for an of health of something in the tool shop in Dearth. Now on Insane, you're gonna start with 250 gold, so it makes shopping a little easier than if you are on Normal and Nightmare. But most of these items are fairly cheap, uh, just save it for something else. And you should actually be able to afford this even on Normal and Nightmare after your trip through Trollmire, which is the first dungeon most people always do. Now. What you want to do for money when you get through Trollmire is come to your gem slot and if you found any, a lot of these sell for quite a bit early on. Later on, the higher tier gems still sell for a lot, but the lower ones early in the game are going to be your big money makers, so make sure to look for that. Alright, on to tip number three. Make use of corners, corridors, and for the love of God, stair dance. When fighting enemies, there are a few things you want to aim for in every fight. 1. Make sure enemies aren't going to surround you, and if you can, have only one enemies in melee range at a time. Corridors can help with this. 2. Don't let enemies use abilities on you as soon as they come off cooldown. If you have no abilities ready as a class that can't just auto attack to victory, and you know the enemy you're fighting can cast at you, dodge around the corner and let your cooldowns reset. Now, if, the en if you know the enemy can't heal, which you'll know as you play along the game, you'll, you'll figure out what rares and uniques can heal, let him come around the corner to meet you so that you don't give him a free turn of damage when you go around the corner. 3. Make sure you have an escape plan. It doesn't matter how strong you are, there will be an enemy that perfectly counters your class. You need to know where the stairs are at all times and have a plan to get back there. All classes have some kind of escape or defense mechanism to where they should be able to get back to the stairs. And if they don't, you can use infusions, which we will go over later, to get back to the stairs. Now, in some scenarios when you enter a new area, there's going to be more enemies waiting for you than you can handle. In these situations, what you want to do is go ham on the closest enemy. Just pop all your defensive cooldowns and your offensive ones and kill something. You need to kill something. You need to make some kind of progress through the chunk of enemies that are in your way. Now once you've done that, head to the stairs and leave. This is known as stair dancing and it was nerfed in the past so that you need to survive at least six turns after killing something before you can leave the area. So there are also certain debuffs that disallow you from leaving the area and it's good to note which abilities these are as you go through the game. Tip number four, movement infusions instead of wild infusions. All right, for the beginners out there, this is a, more of an intermediate tip and is really more useful on insane when you run into ran bosses, which are super strong creatures consisting of more than one class. Now, wild infusions let you clear one debuff and give you a resist all percentage for a number of turns. Movement infusions give you a high amount of bonus movement speed for one to two turns that cancels if you do anything but move. Now movement infusions also have a very powerful effect that is most likely going to be nerfed in patch 1.6, but that could be a year or more from now, so we still have time to use movement infusions to their fullest. Movement infusions give you immunity to stuns, pins, and dazes for five to nine turns, depending on the power of the infusion, and this effect is independent of the movement speed buff. So you can actually use a movement speed or a movement infusion and then go attack and you still have the immunity to stuns, pins, and dazes for however long your infusion says. Now, stun is a very powerful debuff in both the early and late game. We will go over stuns a little bit more later, but because of this, you will need a way to counteract it. Wild infusions can remove stun, and that, that makes them sound like the best choice for this situation, but you will rarely only ever have one debuff on you at any time. Now, the problem with this is the debuff wild infusions remove are chosen at random, and because of this, they are less reliable when it comes to overcoming an enemy with stun. Now, not only this, even if you remove a stun with a wild infusion, enemies are just as likely to reapply, reapply it. Um, or you could have more than one enemy near you that can stun. There are, there are normal enemies that can stun as well. Because of this, 
If you identify your enemy as someone who is likely to stun you, such as an armored skeleton, that's a normal enemy that might stun you, or a bulwark, rare, unique, or ran boss, you can tell if it's a bulwark, if it's got shield wall up, you can see little shields rotating around it. Now you can use your movement infusion just as they get into melee range and buy yourself five plus turns to take them out or at least severely debilitate them to the point that the stun isn't going to matter when it comes later. And on to tip number five. In Tales of Majael, you're going to want to prioritize defensive stats over offensive stats for the most part. Certain enemies can do very high or spiky damage to you, and you want to mitigate this as much as possible. There are a few classes, such as the Rogue or Shadow Blade, that can prioritize damage and speed to the point where defense actually takes a backseat. Now, personally, when I see an item that gives a whopping plus 10 to an attribute, I immediately think, damn, that's a good item. But this is kind of a trap, however, in that stats actually give fairly small increases. Even at plus 10, it's going to be a fairly small increase. Uh, a plus 10 stat on an item is fairly rare, but plus 40% resistances or more spread across different elements or even in a single one, if you're lucky, is fairly common to find. Everyone gets, everyone gets Girdle of Calm Waters, it seems, and, and they get that fairly early, and that belt gives 60% resistances, among other stats. That's 60% resistances on a fairly common early game item. That's crazy. Now, resists are going to be your number one way of cutting down damage that you receive in fights. Now, in a close second, it's going to be armor, but because that only applies to weapon attacks or abilities that use weapon damage in its calculations. So it's not as all-encompassing as resistance is. For most classes, you want to aim for 50 plus percent resistance in all elements by the time you reach endgame. If you can get there sooner, that's great, but don't stop. Always aim to raise your resistances, even if only a little. Tip number six, aim for stun and confusion immunity. Stun is the most dangerous debuff in the game. Stun reduces damage dealt by 60%, puts three random talents on cooldown, and brings you down to 50% movement speed. But the worst part is that talents do not cool down while you are stunned. This can easily lead you to a situation where you have no abilities and no infusions to use with no way to escape. Now because of this, you want to check every item you find for stun resistance. Boots and rings are good sources of stun resistance, but do not limit your search. Check chest pieces, necklaces, and helmets as well. Once you have stun resistance taken care of, confusion becomes your, mo your next most deadly debuff. Now confusion can actually be more deadly to some players than stun, me specifically because of the way it works. Confusion gives you a chance to either perform the action you wanted or cause you to move randomly. Now because of this random chance to not be affected, I sometimes think it's not as big of a deal and then I fail my action 10 turns in a row and get destroyed. The worst part about Confusion though is that a lot of enemies can do it and it will almost always be at range. Now stun, there are some uh, enemies that can cast stun at range, but those are few and far between. Confusion is almost always at range. Now after stun and confusion are taken care of, you want to prioritize your immunities. Disarm and pinning are obviously bad for melees and silence is bad for casters. Blind is almost always bad. If you really have a good mental map, blind isn't so bad, but I do not. Silence resistances are fairly rare to find, however, so don't count on getting it to 100%. Now that isn't such a big issue though, because few enemies actually cast silence. There is one dungeon called the Gorbat Pride where a ton of enemies cast it, but you can kind of dig your way around most of the dungeons, so if that's really a problem, you can bypass it if you really need to. Alright, on to tip number 7. Do not max your skills all at once. I mean, do not go 5 out of 5 in a skill. There are exceptions to this rule, such as casters with an early damage spell, like the Necromancers Invoke Darkness. It would be nice to max that. The Solipsist's Mind Seer is decent to max if you're going to go mind damage. Or sustains that really make the class, such as Mitosis on an Oozmancer. Now that being said, most skills in this game have pretty severe diminishing returns. Even without the diminishing returns, it's almost always beneficial to unlock a new skill than get a tiny boost to an existing one. When deciding whether or not to max a skill after you have unlocked everything you can, make sure to check the diminishing returns. There are a few skills that scale so much more off of stats like track with cunning and very little off of actual talent level. 
Tip number nine, search Zigger and Chateur for tentacle totems or mind blast torques. This is more of an insane tip where the early game can have some almost impossible to kill ran bosses. Mind Slayer ran bosses come to mind, but works for normal and nightmare as well. Tentacle totems allow you to summon a pet tentacle that will attack your enemies for you. The tentacle is especially helpful on very tanky enemies as it has 500 armor penetration. Seriously, inspect it. It has 500 armor penetration. It's crazy. You do need to be careful with the tentacle, however, as when it dies, you're going to take damage as well. I believe it's two-thirds of the life of the tentacle you will take as damage. What this means is that you will rarely want to fight alongside your tentacle and be especially careful around enemies that cast the beam spells or AoE spells. The damage is fairly easy to heal with a decent re regain infusion, so just make sure you don't get hit as the tentacle dies. And the cooldown on it is usually low enough where you can get two tentacles out at once, but don't do that. Only do one tentacle at once to make sure you can heal the damage you take when it dies. The Mind Blast Torque is a bit easier to use, but it's not quite as powerful. Mind Blast Torques basically give you access to Mind Seer from the Solipsist class at different damage amounts based on the power of the Torque itself. Now the funny part is, Mind Blast Torques can actually have higher values than the actual Mind Seer ability itself. Mind Seer is a Mind Damage Beam attack that checks the mental save of the target, and if it fails that check, it has the damage that the enemy takes. But it's still a Beam Damage Torque, and it's still going to be doing at least 80 damage even when it fails, so that's pretty good, especially if you're a melee class, you can kind of kite with a Mind Blast Torque. Now to enter Zigger, you're, it's an anti-magic town, so you're going to need to make sure you have no abilities that are labeled is a spell. The easiest way to accomplish this is to either go to Zigger first or go to Last Hope and replace your runes with infusions. And so we leave the best for last. Tip number 10, you are going to die a lot. Do not get discouraged. It took me over a year before I realized you can actually get four category points instead of three. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up Backup Guardians. There are going to be so many things you don't get or understand at first, but this game is huge and has such high replayability. People like Sir Concretus have over 10,000 hours played. That is freaking insane. Ask chat if you have any questions. There are many people there, like myself, waiting to answer the same questions we asked when we were new. Uh, if you are looking for me in game, I'm Fred Surdy, and if you ever see me take a hiatus from making videos, it's because I got re-addicted to this damn game.